to introduce you to some of the concepts about keyboard navigation and accessibility. And why we thought it would be good to cover this topic first is because it's kind of it covers one of the fundamental aspects of accessibility and testing for accessibility, which gives us good building blocks uh, to, to move on from. And hopefully increasing awareness of this within our solutions will have a, a positive impact on looking at our services and improving them. And it also introduces other concepts that hopefully we'll be able to discuss in future meetings. And, as you have already uh, agreed amongst yourselves, when we what we mean by using the keyboard is when we can't use the mouse or we don't want to use a mouse or a trackpad, that we have an alternative that we can use the keyboard. And the, the keyboard is not only for just keyboard users, but it also unlocks some functionality that other assistive technologies use, like um, Sip and Puff, for example. And the focus indicators that we use when we're making our way around the keyboard tend to also be used by screen readers or dictation software. And of course, power users tend to love using keyboard shortcuts. As James said, sometimes it's, it's actually more effective to use the keyboard to answer some um, training materials and so on. So the keys that we would use usually will be the tab key, to move between elements on the page. Uh, shift tab takes us backwards. Enter or return will select links. And uh, if we're selecting checkboxes, the space bar will usually uh, apply those uh, checkboxes. And with a radio, with radio buttons, we move between them using the cursor key. So I'm going to give you a very quick uh, demonstration on a sample uh, website. I just put this together just rather than using a university site. I didn't want to trigger anyone, so I thought I'd just do something um, completely generic. So I'm going to tell you more about skip to content in a moment, but I'm pressing the tab key. You can see now, hopefully, you can see I've focused on the login page. Then I'm going through some navigation items. And then I start going through uh, some links within an article. Here I've reached some checkboxes and I can move between them with tab or shift tab and select them with the space key. Though these are native checkboxes. Some designers prefer to build their own because they could they control the look, but we have to consider accessibility if we do that to make sure that they work with a the keyboard. These are radio buttons. I can move left and right with the cursor keys to select between those. And if I press tab again, here are some custom radio buttons because you can see because the native radio buttons have the blue uh, to show that they're selected. Some designers would rather be able to have more control, so we might make custom buttons, but we need to make sure that those work. So I can use the keyboard uh, to go between those as well. In terms of who uses keyboard navigation, I've got some various stats you can see here. So it's, it's a significant number of or proportion of people who might have uh, difficulties with dexterity, which could include people who have certain conditions that impair or limit their fine motor skills. And as uh, we mentioned earlier, you might prefer, if you have a visual impairment and seeing the pointer or having that hand-eye coordination might be more difficult. Or if you've used drag and dip, for example, to um, navigate around a screen just through speech, you probably found yourself saying tab, 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 and so on to move around. Or you might just have a broken mouse. The, this, that's an example of a situational impairment. And these slides from Microsoft Design show different types of impairment. And while we shouldn't uh, consider temporary or situational impairments as being in the same league as a permanent impairment, they are quite useful for considering when accessible technology might be beneficial to us. So looking at touch, if uh, we broke our arm or our hand or wrist from our dominant hand, it might be hard to use the mouse. Or working from home, we might be dealing with a child or a pet with our dominant hand and not so easy to use the mouse at the same time when we're trying to work. What recommendations do we need to follow to make sure that our services are available to use with the keyboard? And we're going to start talking about the web content accessibility guidelines, which you might hear us calling WCAG. They have a number of uh, a large number of guidelines, including on keyboard navigation. They're broken down into three levels of conformance, A, double A, and triple A. A is the minimum up to triple A, which is the enhanced level. And we should be aiming at double A at a minimum and ideally aiming at triple A when we can. 
I'm just going to cover a few which I've broken down into different sections. Firstly, that we can actually use the keyboard. Then that there's consideration for our experience, which is a little different when we're using the keyboard. And also, if we do not have any visual impairments, that, uh, that we can see the focus indicators that they're visible to us. Accessibility guidelines are broken down into four levels uh, or four principles, perceivable, operable, understandable and robust. And first, we're going to look at operable, that we can actually use the site. So at the minimum level, uh, websites should be operable with a keyboard, except if they require specific timings, like we have to hold down one key and then another key quickly, or if there's something which has a requires certain kind of movement paths, like you might have if we were using freehand drawing. But at the triple A enhanced level, that's where we have uh, the site is available entirely to use using a keyboard. When we're then looking at our use of the keyboard, and this is where we go into that second group, there's something called bypass blocks. You might not have heard of the phrase bypass blocks before, but you've probably seen things on a web page like skip to content. So that allows you to bypass any repeated navigation that occurs on every page to get straight to the content. And that's one aspect of making things just that little bit uh, easier in terms of understanding the experience of a user using the keyboard. We also have something like focus order, where when we're making our way through elements on a page, that they do so in that uh, logical order, which Julia mentioned. And just to go back to that example, if I just refresh and go up to the top, my first tab on this site, I've got skip to content, uh, just to show you using the mouse. If otherwise, I would next go to login and then the navigation. But if I select skip to content, then I've moved into the article and my next tab goes to the first link in that article. And considering focus order, these links appear sequentially in the reading order in this case. So that makes more sense. Something else that you might have encountered, you might not think of it as a keyboard trap, but this is explaining when um, you're using the keyboard and you somehow you get locked into a certain element of the interface or the page and you can't get out. And an example I find commonly is these uh, modal pages, which are like pop-ups. And ideally to exit this modal, this pop-up page, we'd press the escape key to leave it. If uh, in less good circumstances, we might have to tab into that X and then press return to leave it. But there are some examples out there where you can't use the keyboard to get out of them. You have to use the mouse. So we want to make sure that we don't trap our users uh, while they're using the keyboard. Thinking in terms of perceivable, we need to be sure that the focus indicator is visible. And here's an example where in that button, I when once I've selected it, I have a nice solid outline around it. And I've also changed the, the color of the button to show that it's been selected. You might see this as well when we hover over elements with a mouse. So, um, in the latest version, well, the at least the 2.2 version of WCAG, there's a new uh, criteria about focus appearance. And I actually prefer this triple A level because I think it's simpler than the double A level. I'll tell you why in a moment. But at the triple A level, it's saying that the focus indicator should have at least two pixel border around it and that the color changes have a significant difference, enough contrast that people will be able to notice that it has changed. I'll tell you a bit more about contrast ratios in a moment. And also that it is uh, not obscured by anything else that we've created on the page. So we can always see that focus indicator. At the double A level, it actually makes it that we can have a like less contrast and a thinner uh, number of pixels, like say one pixel minimum, but it adds that the when we change elements like the color, that we should have not only significant contrast to the background, but also significant contrast to adjacent items. I think it's my experience is actually simpler just to aim higher and not have that, therefore not having to worry about the adjacent contrast. But in the full slide deck, I've got a lot of hidden slides with some more information which you can check out. Where we mentioned color contrast, here's uh, nine boxes showing uh, text. Uh, which is in rows of three. The top row 
most would agree are hard to read. Bottom row, most would agree are easy to read. We're talking about the contrast between the text and the background. But what about that middle row? How do we know if, uh, if it's really uh, good, good, easy enough to read for, for most people? The content accessibility guidelines provide a, a way that we can measure the contrast. And if it reaches a certain level, then according to these guidelines, then it should be uh, sufficient. And hopefully in a future session, we will uh, look at that in more detail. So uh, we were looking at using the keyboard, having consideration for keyboard users and making sure that the visual indicators are, are clear and visible. In terms of what I'd say you should be remembering when you're testing a site or using a site or someone asks you to have a look at a new potential service, can you use the keyboard? without getting trapped in any of the elements? Is the order that you make your way through sensible? Can you see the focus indicator? And are you able to skip to content? I'm gonna finish with a demonstration on one of the newer university web pages, uh, which, uh, and I know that at the bottom of this page, I've got a button where I can order or get to a page where I can order the prospectus, which is something that most people might be interested in that when they're looking about at a, at a university page. So my first tab, I get skipped to content, I can press enter, I've then bypassed the navigation which appears at the top of every page. And as I make my way down, I can see whether I feel that the focus indicator has sufficient thickness and contrast to the background to make it clear. YouTube example, we don't have so much control over ourselves because it's from a third party. As I keep going, I can have got quite a good idea of where that focus indicator is. And then I finally, I reach the button uh, where I could order a prospectus. I press the enter key and now I've arrived at that page.